AIDS is a real bona fide disease. Its etiology is a virus, which we call HIV. Its pathogenesis is uh, the process by which the cells that are infected have certain changes uh, and certain periods of latency, but ultimately result in progressive T cell loss, as well as many, many other cells besides lymphocytes being infected. It has a wide variety of morphologies, most of which are the result of secondary opportunistic infections. And clinical expressions of the disease are the same uh, as the morphology. It's a wide variety of opportunistic infections, neoplasms, progressive immune failure, death uh, often, uh, and expression of the uh, viral RNA in the blood called the viral load. Epidemiology of AIDS has uh, changed a bit. In general, the heterosexual uh, causes are on the rise. The homosexual causes are on the decline. The intravenous causes, still big and number two, have remained about the same, haven't changed very much. The uh, virus itself is the etiology of the disease and there are a wide variety of uh, antigens coded by generally genes, which we'll talk about. The GP120 antigen, little tip of the ball here, is always the most famous one. The stalk connecting the GP120 to the virus is GP41. The matrix is underneath that, often termed P17. There's a capsid underneath that, often called B24. There's protease, which, as you might guess, would be uh, involved in the cell's uh, uh, invasiveness or the ability to chew through human cells to do what it has to do. There is the enzyme called reverse transcriptase uh, as part of its genome, uh, which is, does the opposite. That's why it's called reverse transcriptase, because it's a process from which RNA goes to DNA rather than vice versa, which you normally see in transcription. In the pathogenesis of the disease, we have viruses which attach to cell membranes. They could be T cells. Uh, they could be lymphocytes. But they could really be any cell and eventually result in the virus doing its thing in the cytoplasm, butting off new uh, virin, virion particles and then these, of course, traveling on to infect uh, more cells. Here is a picture of an early bud, which looks like no more than a membrane thickening on ele a transmission electron microscopy here. Here's another uh, real nice picture of late budding. And here's some uh, spectacular pictures of the three uh, virions, perhaps freshly made. Uh, the basis for most of the therapy of AIDS in the early days uh, were drugs that would be able to inhibit reverse transcriptase. Let's define reverse transcriptase properly. It's an uh, enzyme. It's used by the retrovirus to transcribe single-stranded RNA into single-stranded DNA and subsequently construct a complementary strand of DNA, providing uh, a way from which a uh, RNA is now transcribed to DNA. So that's why it's called reverse transcriptase. If you look at the various common uh, uh, genes, part of the genome in the uh, HIV virus, and of course HIV virus is a redundant term, isn't it? There is a gag gene. There's a pole gene, P-O-L. There's V-I-F, V-P-R. And these are all uh, the primary um, parts of the genome which encode for the various viral uh, protein areas we talked about, including uh, polymerases, including proteases, including reverse transcriptase. So if you hear GAG, pole, VIF, VIPR, VUPU, N, these are all genes which are... Uh, coding for portions of the um, HIV protein. Clinically, uh, 
pathogenesis of the disease results in a primary infection uh, through blood, sex, saliva, uh, followed by a lymphoid infection and an acute uh, viral type uh, syndrome, uh, so-called prodrome effect, within several weeks after the primary infection. There is an immune response. There's a long latency period, often many years, seven, ten years is about average. And then by the time the expression of full-blown AIDS, so to speak, happens, we then see a variety of opportunistic infections based on total failure of the immune system. And if you, I would be really happy if you thought of these processes linearly because you can't get a lymphoid infection unless you've had a primary infection, and you can't get an acute syndrome unless you've had a lymphoid infection, and so on and so forth. And what we call AIDS, of course, is at the very end of the pathogenesis. Here's a nice diagram talk, uh, in which we have the primary infection, the lymphoid infection, the acute syndrome, the latency, and full-blown AIDS. If you would like to look at that in terms of uh, uh, graphs, uh, if you would like to look at the dotted blue line here as representing uh, the clinical uh, latency, you can see that from the, uh, let's say, six weeks from the acute syndrome from the beginning of the infection, we have a, a period which you can see lasts an average of about seven or eight years before the uh, rise of uh, clinical symptoms resulting in opportunistic infections and then often in death. So uh, if you looked at some of the antibodies involved with AIDS, the anti-P24 antibody probably starts to appear, let's say, an average of eight to nine to 12 weeks after infection and it stays up for many years. There's an anti-envelope antibody that appears even quicker and stays up even longer. And then uh, there are just various viral particles, which is represented by this red line, which of course has a rapid peak during the viral prodrome and then stays very, very low levels until, of course, uh, full-blown AIDS happens and then they rise rapidly. This is when you're apt to get your greatest increases in um, RNA, or viral RNA. Some of the general immune abnormalities include uh, lymphopenia. Why? Because the lymphocytes are being destroyed. Decreased T cell function. Uh, B cell clonal, polyclonal activation resulting in increased expression of variety of antibodies. And of course, not only are the T cells decreased in function, but so are your uh, monocyte uh, macrophage uh, functions as well. The common uh, opportunistic infections with AIDS, cryptosporidium, PCP, toxoplasmosis, uh, candida, TB, nocardia, and a whole wide variety of herpes virus type viruses, some of which are very, very, very rare unless uh, you are in severely immunocompromised patients. PCP was very, very rare until the AIDS epidemic came around, and now you can assume that every AIDS patient carries it. Toxo was considered to be rare uh, as well. Very, very common effect, especially CNS in AIDS patients. Uh, PCP could express itself as a, a, the radiologist will call it a cotton wool or woolly uh, infiltrates throughout the lung fields. And coincidentally, the pathologist will also use the word wool when referring to microscopically a woolly or cottony type substances in the alveoli, which if they are stained with silver stain, you can see the actual pneumocystic, pneumocystis. Uh, organisms. Cryptosporidium, uh, an organism which pretty much adheres 
to the epithelial cells of the large bowel can cause dysfunction of that. And of course, the main symptom would be diarrhea. TB or caseating granulomas, as you see here, uh, very, very, very uh, common with uh, HIV patients. Here's some multinucleated giant cells. Here's some caseation or necrosis in the middle of the granuloma. And here you could see a little lymphocytic uh, cuff of reaction around the histiocytic clusters or macrophage clusters, which is the granuloma. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma, B cell lymphomas, CNS lymphomas, cervix cancer, squamous cell, all the result of uh, AIDS. Uh, and in most cases, it's really the result of other viruses, like HPV going rampant uh, when it uh, can't be uh, fought off properly. CNS lymphomas were basically unheard of until AIDS came around. And now, it's probably the first or second most common cause of a space-occupying brain lesion in the AIDS patient. A wide variety of B-cell lymphomas, and of course, Kaposi sarcoma, not caused directly by the AIDS virus, but a herpes virus, which is uh, uh, allowed to do uh, run rampant uh, when there's no immune protection. I think we'll uh, end the discussion here and finish up with amyloidosis as the last uh, segment of this chapter. Thank you very much.